Q&A started. So um, first, I would the first person I would like to welcome to the stage is Nancy Armstrong. Nancy um, is the executive producer of uh, the film The Disruptors. Please. Um, Tim Armstrong, who is uh, a subject in the film. And Tom. Hi, Tom. <laughs> Tom Scott, as well. And we've got also Kenny Dichter, surprise special appearance by Kenny Dichter. <laughs> I don't have a bio on you, Kenny, but you can give your own little quick bio. Um, thank you for uh, joining us. I was going to say, now that I saw the film, I guess I'm a genius. So, yes. Uh, quick bio is a serial entrepreneur, grew up in Long Island, went to school at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, I'll fast forward. You know, Tim and Nancy have been partners of mine. Uh, we disrupted a business in private aviation twice. The first one, Marquee Jet, sold to Berkshire Hathaway in 2010. Uh, couldn't sit still, uh, did a, uh, a second run, a second act at it, a company called Wheels Up, we started from scratch. Tim, my fellow HD, uh, ADHD-er, uh, over an Italian restaurant, we drew a picture of what the new business Wheels Up needed to look like eight years ago, and we took it public, New York Stock Exchange, uh, July 14th this year. Awesome. So, 2X. Awesome, thank you. Um, so Tom Scott right here. Tom is a legendary entrepreneur. He founded the beverage company Nantucket Nectars in 1989. Tom currently serves as CEO of the Nantucket Project, an annual event that brings together individuals to engage in innovative thinking around global issues, providing pre fresh, fresh perspectives and solutions. Tom was a former board member of the Greenwich International Film Festival. He is a film and television producer and has had films in both the Cannes and Sundance Film Festivals. His television series um, on the Nascent Brothers aired on HBO. Most recently, uh, Tom produced the documentary film Apple Pushers with Edward Norton. Prior to that, he founded Plum TV, which became a national network of eight stations receiving more than 14 Emmy Awards in total. Thank you, Tom, for joining us. Um, um, and then we have uh, we have Tim Armstrong. Tim is the founder and CEO of Flowcode, the offline to online company building direct connections between brands and consumers through next generation QR technology. He has had a robust career. He was a member of Paul Allen's first internet company, which was acquired by Disney. After that, he moved to New York with Disney and worked at ABC ESPN Internet Ventures. He then joined America's Health Network, which was later sold to News Corp. Armstrong then went to become a founding team member of Snowball, after which he joined a little company called Google as its first New York employee, where he stayed for almost a decade, serving as president of, um, president of the Americas. He joined AOL as chairman and CEO to spin the company out of Time Warner and launch AOL as a publicly traded company. After turning AOL around, he sold the company to Verizon, where he became CEO of Verizon's digital division, Oath. He is an active member of the community and serves on numerous local and national boards. Um, and then at the end, we have Nancy Armstrong. And uh, as mentioned, Nancy is the producer of this uh, film. She is um, an Emmy-nominated producer um, of Happy Warri Warrior Media. Um, the Disruptors is the first definitive film on ADHD. Previously, she co-founded the award-winning women's leadership and media platform, Makers, that was named one of the 100 best websites for women by Forbes and received the Women's Media Center Awards for its groundbreaking contribution to women, history, and America. Prior to Makers, Nancy was a senior executive at Ogilvy Public Relations worldwide in New York City. She made her start as a professional actress and singer. She is a trustee at the King School in Stanford and on the board of directors of the Children of Fallen Patriots Foundation and the US Olympic Paralympic Foundation. She lives in Connecticut with her husband, Tim, and their three teenage children. Um, so thank you all for joining us. That's a pretty beefy resume for some kids whose um, teachers in, in lower school may not have, have known that they were gonna be <laughs> that, that full. But, um, 
Thank you so much again for, for um, creating this film. Uh, I loved it, I've, I've watched it many times. I myself have ADHD and am the parent of a child with ADHD. Um, so uh, so a, lot of, a lot of this really hit home. Um, Nancy, what was your, I'd like to start by asking you, what was your inspiration for making the film? Well, first of all, thank you so much for coming out on a Monday night. I'm really so touched and I'm happy that everyone made it and also thank you to Greenwich Film Festival, Wendy and Ginger for just jumping in to support the film, as well as Andy Emile of Greenwich Magazine. They didn't, hadn't even, haven't even seen the film, and they jumped right on board to, to do this event. Um, the impetus for the film was really, I didn't have a film when I needed one when I was raising three children with ADHD. Um, my son was diagnosed at age eight, and you know it was that moment in the diagnostician's office where you're listening to the diagnostician rattle off all the symptoms of ADHD and you're you're dealing with that stunning news and then you know to my right my husband was slinking down in his seat and you know his hand is going up and he says I have all those symptoms um, so it was just that struggle and I'm particularly I think sixth grade it was like rock bottom struggle we would go you know to the parent teacher conferences and on on a, on a bench there'd be like books covering this entire bench, and I go, honey, I hope those aren't Jack's books covering the entire bench, and all the other kids had their books in the locker, and we would go over, and it was Jack Armstrong, Jack Armstrong, so. Um, we were in that struggle, and it seemed like we were alone, and I think, you know, being in a super competitive um, community, uh, people don't talk about ADHD, and they don't talk about the strengths-based approach, and I started connecting those dots when, you know, Tim was diagnosed, and then all of these people that he worked with that were entrepreneurs and CEOs were also had kids that were diagnosed. And then I met Ned Hallowell, who pioneered the strengths-based approach in 1994 with his book, Driven to Distraction. And I thought, you know, I wanted to set people free and also let people know that, yes, there are the challenges and we're all dealing with those, but there are these strengths. And there's so much stigma and shame associated with ADHD, which is kind of ridiculous when you think of how successful they have the potential to be if they can leverage those strengths and really capitalize on that and you know manage the downside. So we didn't want to sugarcoat that, but that was basically the reason. Awesome. Um, I thought it was an incredibly important point that was made during the film that ADHD is not a diagnosis for lazy people, that it is a matter of brain function and not of willpower. Um, what would you say, Kenny? I'll start with you. Um, uh, are some of the challenges you faced in managing ADHD in your daily lives? Uh, it's a good question. I would say, first off, full disclaimer, it didn't, uh, we, I don't have a bio, which is typical. Uh, I'm, I'm probably the lowest uh, SAT, lowest GPA CEO uh, of, a, of a New York Stock Exchange company, so I just want to say that. Um, but I, I would say it's interesting, um, you know, there's a, uh, a magical chaos to having ADHD. I would say, by the way, Ned, who, uh, Dr. Ned, he, he diagnosed me on the phone. When Nancy and Tim, they know me a long time. Uh, two of my daughters, uh, ADHD uh, diagnoses, anxiety, and it's funny, as I was watching the film, a lot of it, Nancy, thank you for making the film, it actually clarified some things for me uh, about my daughters. But uh, I would say, look, it, it's the magical chaos uh, I never would be uh, as successful as an entrepreneur uh, if, if I didn't, if I wasn't blessed with the, uh, with the disorder. I, I like to call it, you know, an advantage. Um, but I would also say that not everybody is going to be Albert Einstein or Terry Bradshaw or anybody sitting up here. I, I think what I take away from, you know, managing uh, this is really getting the 9.4% of people and kids in the United States that are diagnosed, the, the proper structure and help. And then, again, you'll get more magical results, I think, if you get people into the, into the proper care and, and, and educate the parents. And that's really what I took out of, the, uh, out of the documentary. And I would just say, you know, for myself, um, I think it's a challenge every day, you know? I mean, I, I, can't, I still can't clean my room. Yeah. I just, uh, I made enough uh, that I could get someone to clean it for me. So, yeah. you know, that, that's where I'm at. So I guess that's compensation. <laughs> yeah. um, absolutely. Um, 
Tim, um, what do you find are, uh, again, I'm, I have the ADHD and a child with ADHD, so um, what do you find are challenges in raising uh, a child with ADHD since you have um, similar proclivities? Yeah, you know, I think there's a, a benefit to having it with parenting because I can, I can see their, uh, their reactions. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of situations I can recognize and understand why they're happening. It still is very hard to have the patience to, uh, to deal with it, but I would say like with having kids with ADHD, I think it comes down to a few things. I think one is you gotta talk to them in the environment that works for them. Like one of the things we used to do with our son is at night shut the lights off and talk to him like lie in bed with him when he was having issues. And I think the sensory thing of having the lights off, he would like open up and, and talk to us. And then with one of our daughters, um, I usually take her to exercise. I notice when she exercises, she's like more focused and stuff. So I, I think there's a little bit of parenting with ADHD magic. And I think the second thing with ADHD, just as a as a parent trying to teach the kids, it's it's about the three or four Ps. It's uh, it's having great, trying to be a great parent to them and being patient. I think it's having um, I'll call it great professors. I know there's some teachers here. I think having teachers that are supportive matters uh, a lot. Choosing a profession that meets um, ADHD is important. And the last thing is choosing the right partner. And with Nancy, obviously, I got the right partner. Um, and uh, she, I, I've That's seen- five Ps. That's five Ps. We, we, uh, who, who's counting? Why, why would you count? Uh, but uh, I, I would just say that, um, it's uh, the stress level, especially in a town like Greenwich, is really high to have ADHD. So I just think having extra patience, is the, that's probably the most important P. Uh, and don't give up on the kids. Um, you make the, the point in the film. Thank you, Katie. Uh, you make the point in the film, uh, which is really important and, and inspiring for the kids, I think, that see the film, that some of the world's most successful people, um, you all included, have had many of the symptoms um, of ADHD if, if they have not been formally diagnosed. Vincent Van Gogh, Thomas Edison, Michael Phelps. Channeling the hyperactivity into positive outlets uh, is critical for me, I know. Um, Tom, what are some things you do to center yourself? You know, um in some ways, you know, some of that was hard to watch. In part, because like one, I haven't been around people in a long time. Two, I like didn't dress the right way. I, I had to go home and change, by the way. <laughs> yeah, like, well, yeah, and like I didn't, I, I, it's a long story, but I was at a meeting, I didn't even have a car, I had to rush home, and I'm sitting there, and I was truly like thinking, what a loser I am, you know? I'm not kidding. And then the other part is like, you know, as somebody, I, like alcohol became a solution for me. And I've been sober for almost 15 years. Um, now, I'm mentioning that because, you know, I'd already seen the film, but then when you're watching it, in a, like, I see it in my house, so it's like my own private movie, right, that no one else will ever see. And then I sit in a room with a bunch of people. It's like, oh, right, lots of other people are going to hear this and see this. But the part when they were talking about the dopamine, you know, where they're outlining what the dopamine is, um, you know, I think one of the, one of the challenges in, in, in our culture and in most cultures is that pe most people don't believe in compulsions. Compulsions is for, the la is for the lazy people. Like, my distraction isn't a compulsion, it's just I'm a spoiled brat who wants to look out the window. Now, I can look at myself and say that's not true, okay? But I can look at other people, like when you're in sobriety, you're in a community of people every day for 15 years, and I see other people who have what are in effect compulsions. They are compulsions, and, and in, the, in, the, in the case of what we're talking about here, um, often for hyper-focus like a real desire that your plane looks exactly the way you want it to look. And I think a lot of other people don't or have to. Or you freak out. Or you freak out. <laughs> but, so, but the question you asked, and, and it's impossible for, I could lie and BS you, but the, one of the reasons I know how to solve the problem you just mentioned is because I had to do that in order to be sober. And in order to be sober, I have to meditate. I have to pray. I have to walk. I have to exercise. I have to journal. I have to do a lot of things that I do as a part of my life. And it works incredibly well. You know, it works incredibly well. And, and I would add that um, that doesn't mean I don't sit here and think, oh my God, I'm gonna go up on stage in a minute. I, you know, I feel very sensitive to the way the chemistry of my system is. So I think that's something yeah. that's just true. Is you, you feel like super on and focused, and the next day I can feel like I have no idea what's even in my brain. And that's who I am. Um, and in certain moments I get a little ashamed of it, right? 
and, and in that way I can sort of identify with, like I, I got upset because I used to, my son has, a, has this, and I treated him like shit a lot of times, you know, where I would just, what's the method? He's being lazy, I'm gonna punish the hell out of him. I didn't really think it through that way. And now I look at that and I think, you know, that's who he thinks I think he is at his core. Mm -hmm. And that's, at, and I'm learned, that's what this film did for me, by the way. Because I'd heard all the ADD stuff, but I never saw it in one place, well organized, so that I could sort of see it and understand it, and then be able to, because I thought it was a BS thing too. Even my own diagnosis, so that's a BS. Anyway, I just said a lot, but the, but the answer to that is I have to do practices, and those became gifts that I can just use in other parts of my life. Thank you. Um, you mentioned hyperfocus, and I think that's um, that's a very interesting part of the film as well. Um, I, I also have the ability to hyper-focus on something, but I have little or no ability to focus on something I'm not interested in. Um, I was wondering if you all have, what are some tools that you've de developed to be able to focus on the things that you have to that are outside of your... So I, I would say, first off, you know, the gift of being able to hyper-focus, and I would say for me, and I, I would say knowing the, the two other guys uh, up here, uh, the ability to visualize things and, and then go task them out and do it. You know, you can visualize and have a dream and, and actually picture that in your head and then, then, go, then go create that, which uh, I think is a, a really wonderful part. I think the other piece, which you're referring to, is when you have to get something done that's just not in the strike zone, how do you do it? I think, you know, like uh, you, have to, you have to force it. I think as a kid uh, or as a young person, you may not have that ability. I think as, as I'm getting older, I'm I'm working on my my ability to do things that, you know, aren't necessarily as fun or or as uh, that you have to do. I would say one thing that, you know, to first off, I I don't like to be bored. It's a terrible feeling, which I just like to over, you know, just do a zillion things, uh, whether they make sense or not. But one thing I would say that's been a real therapeutic for me is using the platform that I've created and that we've created for good, and I, just one quick example is when the COVID crisis hit in early March, I knew we had all these great ambassadors, whether it was Tom Brady or Russell Wilson and Sierra, Serena Williams, and the biggest personalities in the world, J-Lo, A-Rod, when they were together. Um, we had all these big personalities, and I knew that I, it wasn't the right time to market private jets, but what we did is we turned wheels up into meals up literally tracked down the CEO of Feeding America and on the spot pledged 10 million meals and just said, that's what Wheels Up is gonna do. We're now 70 million meals in. And I think that for me, you know, my hobby is helping other people and, you know, using the, uh, the platform or just, you know, my, that, that magical chaos for good. And I would say that that's, you know, one of the things that I think Nancy uh, and the team got done with this film was you know, really laying out. I, I watch that film and say, I wonder if there are ways that, that we can help, you know, help other people understand what this is. You talked about the frustration, you know, kind of turn that frustration into something positive uh, as it relates to, I love that the people participated. You know, I should have played more football. Terry Bradshaw, I mean, you know, got Super Bowls. Or, or will I am? I, I, got a hit in, I got a hit in me, and I never wrote it, you know, you know, so. I would just say for me, um, I have this probably similar to Tom, this thing I call meds, which is meditation, exercise, diet, and sleep. And when those things are going well, I think the other thing is I'm very careful about what I say is uh, you are who you meet and you are um, what you eat. And I mean eat by like what information you eat, what goes in your eyes, what goes in your ears. And um, <clears throat> I would just say, I'll just say two things about Tom and Kenny. Tom, sitting right to my right, had a huge effect on me. I stopped drinking 15 months ago just because when, I, when Nancy started doing all the stuff about ADHD, I realized how much that probably affected my brain, and I would stop by and saw Tom, and we, we talked about it. And um, Tom had a significant impact in terms of how I live my life, and uh, you're somebody, Tom. I think that part of ADHD is making sure you're around people that make you better, and Tom's one of those people. And then Kenny has um, been a friend also for a long time, and I think part of HDHD with, uh, ADHD with Kenny has been the ability to be like a creative partner, and we talk almost every day. We met 15 years ago, and... That's like a medication for me, too. It's, it, is, it is medication. 
Um, so I, I think like who, who you who you meet and and what you eat, and I think um, I'm a big believer in the average of five also, which is you become the five things you hang around with the most. And I think as an ADHD person, having some guardrails around that is um, super important, super super important. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think screens is uh, is something a big issue we're obviously all confronting these days. I find that it negatively impacts myself um, as well as my daughter. Um, how do you all manage um, the 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 constant communication on so many different devices? Um, uh, how do you think those affect um, people with ADHD, and how do you manage that yourselves? Like the tens of thousands of text messages, emails, and. You know, if I would say, and I can't prove this, and maybe there is good um, research on this, but the the level of spaced out in this that I observe in kids, and one of my one of them being my son, is way more than what we grew up with. Now, I attribute that, and again, this is the non scientific part, but I look at the phone and I think that thing is a massive problem. Now, I have it too, so I'm not just pointing. Uh, a finger at my son, but but one of my sons is is he goes to boarding school now, and um, it's very simple. When he goes to camp in the summer, where they don't allow the phones, and I would visit him, he was lit up, like he was. I could see the glow in his eyes, the smile in his face, the energy in his step was so real. Then you come back to Greenwich, Connecticut, and you see kids doing this all day, including him and including me too. So I'm not innocent of this, and he's depressed, and he's anxious, and he's lost, and um, so, you know, I thought, I want him to go to camp school, you know, and yeah. so we went on a, a hunt for boarding schools where the, they don't do the phones. He is so happy. So none of what I just said is scientific, but I think those screens are just a freaking mess, like terrible, terrible. I, I couldn't agree more. I'm going to do something here physically here. I'm going to hand you this. First off, I'm one of the last people with Jeff Bezos on a BlackBerry. Hold on. Then I'm going to pull it. What was the question about screens? Yes. Hold on. So this is an iPhone for anybody. Hold on one second here. You know, we, 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 we need redundancy, right? So hold on. It's another screen. This was not planned. I didn't even know she was going to ask. Hold on. Just in case I lose my juice, my charger. Um, and I think I have a fourth in the car. And by the way, they're all synced up. There's a lot of redundancy there. It's a whole other story. But the, uh, the question about screens, I think they're incredibly dangerous. Like you, I watch my kids. I have three girls, 21, 17, and going to be 14. Way too much screen time. What I did, uh, you know, my, my answer to the, my screen crisis was before I go upstairs every night, I put my screens to bed downstairs and I don't take them upstairs, which has changed my life dramatically. I also, because I'm sensory, if I hear these things buzzing, I haven't figured out one of these things, I gotta, then you gotta turn off for me, but I turn off all of the, I don't wanna be alerted when something's coming in. I just, I want it on silent, so at least I have a little control on when I can go want to hit it or not hit it. But I would just say that the screens, I think, create incredible anxiety uh, for the kids. They create anxiety for me. I just, uh, you know, if, if, if a few hours a day, which is minimal for people, if you're on those screens, you're actually, you're, you, you, they own you, you don't own them. And uh, it's something that I still have to work on here. I'm much happier when I'm not checking my emails and I'm not responding in real time. Uh, but I still have that broadband separation anxiety that I'm missing something. And again, I know I'm not, but I am uh, if I don't, if I'm not uh, participating uh, with the world in, in the, real the time. average teenager Very will be on their phone for 12 waking years of their life at this point. So I think if, as a parent, one of the things I think also with ADHD you got to be careful about is it does the dopamine hits. Nothing gives you dopamine hits more than social media. Um, and if you have ADHD, it is crazy addictive. I think that the good news is I see this younger, the younger people in my office are starting to delete all the social media apps off their phone for the first time. And um, I think as controversial as China has been with the internet, 
China announcing the shutting down video games for kids, I think was, I've at least talked to a lot of people in New York in the last two weeks, were super excited about that news. And Tim, so Tim, you I, were I think, part of this early at Google. You know, I watched The Social Dilemma. I'm sure others have seen it. Isn't a lot of this the big platform companies, the alphabets, the, you know. The your, your kid is competing against server farms with a million servers in them. So you're, you're getting, like if you look at TikTok's algorithm, they're getting, their brain is competing with 100,000 servers. And you can't win. And you can't win, you can't win. And, um, and it's, I think it's one of the things to think about a lot is like where you spend your time, especially with ADHD. Infinite scroll is a black hole. Um, that, that's one of the things I say to our kids all the time. Um, I said this, well, I, I, I asked you this question in the beginning, but um, for you, Tim and Tom, I've, I found particularly back when we were kids, many children with ADHD went undiagnosed and therefore had to manage um, their educations without support. Um, to, my youngest is at Wimward School where they're specifically trained in dealing with her learning challenges. Um, I was wondering how you all did in school. Like to go through. Well, first off, Winward's a great school. Uh, my, my daughter spent three years there, and she left, and now she's over at King. Uh, so that, that, that's great. But I would just say, hey, Tom, why don't you take the question? Then we'll talk. Tom's got that ADHD. I, I don't want to stop the guy. And then I'll, I'll come in behind. Well, um, <laughs> well no, what, what I was going to say is, is when, when Nealman uh, was Craig, is that his name, Nealman? Um, David. David, sorry, David Nealman. Um, you know, I think about reading comprehension. I read a lot of books, a lot. And I want to be clear, I listen to a lot of books. I cannot read. I can't. And when on, on my SATs, total disaster on reading comprehension. I, I mean, I got actually quite good SATs. I was a pretty good student. I'm good at math. And I can write. I cannot read. And, and, it, and, and again, like I know, because people like, it's not as good to listen to a book. Like, I, because I feel those cues. People will say that, well, he actually listens to them. Like, that's what people will say. Um, you're damn right I listen to them, because that's how I can consume them. I cannot do it. I literally, I cannot do it. So think about this. There's like three or four paragraphs, and then underneath there's questions. I can't answer the questions on the paragraph that are right above that, like right above that. Like literally they could ask like, what was the main character's name? No freaking clue. Like I have no idea. And so people think, are you being lazy? Are you stupid? No, when I look at words, I'll tell you another thing, this is a huge advantage. So, By so the way, you should read the New York Post. I read the New York Post every <laughs> day. <laughs> well, so, so, so let, me, let me twist that for a moment. If I walk into a convenience store, I am like so anxious. It's a freaking mess. There's all this stuff all over the place, and I'm like thirsty, and I don't know where to go, and I'm lost. <laughs> but, I'm, but the point is, that's why I was good at selling juice, because I was like, I am going to give people calm, and we're going to draw a straight line across the labels. Like, I mean that. Like, if you could calm me down, that's a good thing. But that's what it's like to look at a book. When you look at a book, you, you see a gazillion hieroglyphs in front of you, and you, you just can't, you're like, I can't do it. And so, but, but the point isn't that I can't consume a story. The point is that's a really bad way to deliver me a story. And then nowadays, every kid who has this problem, like, please give them audiobook. Because imagine reading Moby Dick in sixth grade when you can't read. First of all, the book is not for kids. Like, Anna Karenina <laughs> is not for kids. <laughs> read it, read it, read it. Like, it's, it's like the, the, the love and the, and the social and the science and the, culture. I mean, it's an intense book. And we have kids in high school who can barely read, who no way can identify with the story. And then sm some smart person's going to say, like, my kid's not good at English. Like, bullshit. He shouldn't be reading that book in the first place. I mean, I hate to say it. And someone's like, well, the, I know three kids who loved it and thrived on it. It's like, big deal. What about the other 97 <laughs> kids who couldn't enjoy it? And I, I just, I look at something like that, like, what are we doing? Like, why would we do that to children, particularly some who can't? And so I'm glad a lot of people can read better than I can read. But I'm also, there's a part of me, it's like, I'm not ashamed of the fact that, like, I was born with that. Like, just 
change it a little bit and make it so I can enjoy it too. Which, by the way, it's good that that's actually happening a little bit. Um, anyway, I got animated about that. But the point is, it's a mixed bag for sure. And my grades also, it's like, if the book's boring, disaster headed our way. If I'm into the book, <laughs> like I could get literally like an A plus, no yeah. problem. Or you know, the story or something I'm interested, like some kind of science I'm interested in. It's gonna be good. I'm not interested in, I could get like a, a zero. You know? I, I learned, thank goodness, for Netflix and some of the other, uh, I haven't figured out how to put Apple on my TV, like my kids have to do it. But uh, I, I learned, Tim and I talk about this all the time, documentaries. I watch documentaries. I learn about you know, what people have done in different things, uh, business, life, you know, accomplished. Most documentaries are, if you ever get a documentary made about you, you did something. Um, but I, 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 most of my stuff, I, I, CNBC, the New York Post, uh, ESPN. Uh, my daughter, who has uh, ADHD, she she sits and watches CNBC with me, so she'll probably end up in business. Um, but I think that it's it's really interesting. I think the traditional Western education, plus the screens, is very very tough. I would say sure. I've maybe read twelve or thirteen books in my life. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly which ones. Uh, and I've started about 100. Like, I read the first half, and then I figure I know enough. I, you know, read the back of the cover, and then I try to watch a document. I just enough. And it's enough. I got it. I, I see uh, what they did. I know the end of the story. So I, I'll give you a childhood school story. Is uh, I got thrown out of middle school in eighth grade. Um, they sent me home, kind of like the movie, because I was selling fireworks out of my locker. Like, it was like the... <laughs> About the fifteenth time I've gotten in trouble, so I, I got home and I got into a private school. I grew up in a blue collar environment. I got into a private school, but that was the whole story of my childhood. Was on one side lots of trouble, on the other side something positive would happen, and I kept and so I think school was a really big struggle. But kind of like Tom and Kenny, I'm very like autodidactic. I just learn. I, I don't really care how I learn. I just eat learning, and I think I learned that in my childhood is the only way to survive, basically. It's interesting, you know, as you talk about how you navigated through grade school, I actually went a different direction. I wasn't that interested, or I wasn't interested in most of the schoolwork, but what I ended up doing, it's relationship capital. Tim knows I have a lot of relationship capital. I have great relationships with people. I kind of befriended the assistant principals and the principals. Literally, I was working, I remember as in grade school, I was like kind of able to walk into the office or the principal's office, but not as a guy in trouble but somebody that was like, somebody that the principal could count on, yeah. Uh, a liaise between him and the students. And I literally took that, that gift all the way up through college where Donna Shalala, who was one of the top uh, women uh, chancellors of a Big Ten University, Wisconsin, that I just, it, it occurred to me that I should introduce myself in the first week. And again, the schoolwork was like secondary and the relationship with people like Donna or Barry Alvarez, who was the football coach, I just, it was a, a, an odd way to navigate, you know, from the outside, and my grades really didn't matter. I had the, the relationships where I needed them to, to do what I needed to do. So it's funny how kids adapt uh, and, and go that way, which is a very unusual thing as, uh, as you think about that. That, that's, that is one of the reasons why we started the film festival, um, the documentaries, the way that it's, it's, it's another way to tell stories and it's kind of a quick and effective way to soft serve change. So I've always said, you know, people might not go and see what it's like to be in a refugee camp in Syria or be able to understand what it's like to have ADHD or to have, um, you know, suffer from any other illness. But once you watch a film about it, it's really hard to kind of unwatch it. So. Um, it's an easier way for me to digest information um, than Anna Karenina, but um, anyways, so um, I also uh, love that you mentioned ADHD as a natural pathway to entrepreneurship. Um, you all have been incredibly successful uh, in business, and the ADHD brain does not necessarily think linearly, um, which I think was a really um, interesting thing to emphasize. When creating something, uh, we don't necessarily follow all the steps normal people would say we would have to go through to get something done. We often skip from A to Z with just a few stops in between because we can see a different, often quicker path um, to the end uh, than our counterparts. In your entrepreneurial ventures, how has ADH served you? So you've touched on this a little bit, but. I would say positively. Yes, like, like the impulsivity where you, you say, I can just get to that last step of creating a company of 
uh, without going through all of the, you know. I mean, one of the things I think all three of us probably have, and I know Kenny and Tom do, is I, the ADHD gives you a tremendous ability to connect dots that probably a lot of people don't see. And, um, and then if you're really good at finding people who can make dots, I think that's the perfect, um, you know, combo. And, and um, I think your career as an ADHD person, you probably don't feel successful all the time, but I think one thing it's very clear, and I'd be interested in Kenny and Tom's take, is there's many, 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 many times where I can feel like I can see multiple dots really far out, and then it's a whole series of trying to get dot makers to partner to, to get that path, um, and I think that works out really well. Yeah, and I, I would say, Nancy, it was on the, I think I made the cutting room floor, but I mentioned that for ADHD entrepreneurs, you have to surround yourself with tremendously, just what Tim's saying, tremendously complementary people. You know, we need good CFOs and good engineers to go paint that picture uh, that, that one has in his or her head. So I think one of the skill sets that that you need to identify early, even though you might think you could do it yourself, you need to put a great team around you to be successful as an entrepreneur there. I would say last piece, and Nancy, you probably have a view on this, is risk taking. You know, ADHD folks, uh, entrepreneurs, can be tremendous risk takers. Now that's good, and that, that, you know, that, that, that can be very difficult if you're willing to take certain risks. I just remember, you know, as I'm watching the film, Nancy, the day I got my driver's license, that I was, you know, I was driving before that, but when I got my driver's <laughs> license, I told my mom that I'm taking the family car to Florida when I was 16, and I literally, they said, who are you going with? I said, I'm going myself to visit grandma down in Boca from Long Island, from Merrick, and literally I called them 24 hours later from Florida, the first day that I had my license, which is, again, that's unusual, um, and... It, <laughs> You know, but that I would say is probably in that thing. Nancy, I know you had something. I know, I was just going to say that uh, there's actually a study that was done out of Syracuse University that studied um, people who have ADHD and entrepreneurship, and they were actually more likely to be successful as entrepreneurs if they had one of two things, a college education or a really strong um, life partner or, you know, just had, had a life partner attachment. Um, if they did not have a college education or a strong life partner, then that advantage um, was much less dissipated. So that's just interesting. You know, one, one thing I would add to that, I mean, there, were, there was a couple moments that really caught me in the film today when I watched it, because um, I think this is the third time I've seen it. Um, one of them was, I'm being ADD and forgetting what the first one is, but I'll come back to it. Um, one of the doctors talks about, you know, while these offer strengths, they also call for a certain kind of discipline, okay? And, um, and, and the thing I wanted to say about that was, was that um, the, 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 the rush of focus, I definitely think is, is one of my great gifts, and not because it makes I've been successful in certain things, but because I really love it. Like, I really enjoy that. Like, I think that's something, like, I can't, you know, I'm trying to run a marathon right now. I have all these aches and pains. Like, that's going to go away. My golf game's going to get worse a lot. But I can be curious for the rest of my life. Like, I can enjoy this for the rest of my life. And I feel like that's a gift that I'm, I'm glad to have. I would also add at the same time, though, that, you know, I'm 55 now, and I've been in a variety of different businesses, and you gain a certain amount of confidence, and you also gain a certain amount of power, like people will listen. And I look at cer certain things I've done in the last few years and I think, now you gotta pull it back a little bit. You know, literally, literally like just to run wild with all the ideas, I don't think it's so great either, you know? And I think there's a certain amount of the limits of when I was a younger, call it entrepreneur, that made me better. And that as I've gotten older, I think I would benefit from focus, and, and here's my whole message and what I'm trying to say here, these things are a balance. Like I don't think my son's a genius now because he has ADHD and everything's gonna go well for him now that we know it. I do think that there's, there's an interesting relationship that I wanna pay attention to as much as I can with my son because I don't really know what I'm doing, you know? I hope for that, um, but I think, it's, I think it's both things. And again, I think that, you know, 
I'm glad that the film sort of em emphasizes a certain level of success because I think it'll be good for kids to, and parents to see that. And I think there's a lot of people with ADD who have a gift of curiosity for the rest of life who are, aren't big successful entrepreneurs too. You know what I mean? Like I think it, it's a pathway to so many other joys as well. I, I think it's critical, you know, as I'm listening to everybody speak about it, you know, for my kids and my two girls that I, I think they diagnosed, um, I think as parents, you have to encourage them to find their passions, especially with ADHD, you know, because if they don't have passion and something's going to get boring, they're going to just tap out. And I think that, you know, as I think about my daughters, especially uh, my two that, that are most like me in that way, that I just am encouraging them. I really don't, the schoolwork, the this, the friends, I know that that comes, but I know if they're passionate, they'll be hyper-focused and there's a lot of joy when you're doing something you're passionate about and you can do it 24 hours a day. I think there's a lot of, as you talked about, feeding that curiosity yeah. around a passion. So I think that's a great treatment, if you will, for you know, how to, how to guide or how to parent or mentor uh, you know, children that are, you know, that, that have this. Um, I wanted to give uh, an opportunity to um, any audience members um, to ask a question if you all um, have any. Thanks, Ash. Thank you, Ash. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. You don't want to feel like your kid is different. And I think. Thank you, Nancy, for bringing this to our attention. I wish I'd known this a lot earlier. When my son was diagnosed, I was embarrassed to even get him tested. Um, but I think this should be mandatory for every student. I think it should be mandatory for every teacher. And I think hearing from Kenny and Tom and Tim and from Nancy, um, to have people that are relatable, entrepreneurs that have this, or relatable people, whatever it is, if you're a dancer or Simone, Simone Biles, that there is a pathway to success that doesn't mean reading, writing, arithmetic, because that isn't for everybody. And I think that was my biggest takeaway when Nancy, you've been talking about this for years. So thank you, get the word out. And I hope there's a follow-up because I think it's really critical for us to see where did these kids go to? Because I think they're gonna go on to do extremely amazing things. So thank you, Nance. Thanks, Ann. Uh, thank you. Um, I do have one thing to elaborate kind of on what you're saying which is one thing we didn't talk about here, and I love the chemistry um, that we've seen, and I love that everyone's owning their ADHD superpowers, but Tom, you mentioned that um, you love this film because it kind of brings everything together and, and it creates a clear picture for you know, what is ADHD and how people are dealing with it, and, and it puts it all in one place. And so, Nancy, I, I think if you could just take a minute to talk about how that vision came to light and how you put that all together. I mean, that's like brilliance right there. Oh my gosh, thank you. Well, it was really, I knew the film had to encapsulate the morning nightmare because I, I used to, the alarm went off at 6 a.m. and I would open my eyes and go, I can't, I can't, you know, it just was so difficult. I mean, at one point, 
when my son was 15, I thought, I can't do it, I need law enforcement. So I wanted to be able to capture the difficulty and I had you know, put, put together this super skill set um, just when Tim had, had come home so many times and I think um, we had to hear from those public personalities. You know, when I tried to explain to Jack's sixth grade Latin teacher that there were a lot of really successful people with ADHD and he shouldn't give up on him, um, he stopped returning my emails. Like he just, you know, thought it was, so I didn't have any armor, I didn't have any tools, I didn't have something to consolidate all the best information. There was no film with Hallowell, there was no film with um, Russell Barkley, and these were, these are the two, you know, most um, eminent leaders in the in the field in terms of ADHD. So I wanted to get all the best experts um, to show the struggle with, you know, boys and girls and adults, and then to have this weigh-in of public personalities, which is actually not the formula for an ADHD. So, you know, we, we struggled a little bit, and I really pushed very hard to say that I know it's not the perfect formula to have, you know, people all of a sudden chiming in about uh, their experience, but it's the only way I can prove the theory, or the, um, it's the only way that we can really demonstrate the strengths-based approach. You can't look at the, the four kids in the documentary and go, oh yeah, they're gonna be superstars. It, they're struggling, and it's really hard to see the super skills when your kids are young, so I wanted to be able to show the end of the movie, which is Will I Am, David Nealman, you know, the people on stage, um, Simone Biles, Michelle, Carter and all these people who had exactly the same story as the kids in the film and came out the other side much because of a parent or a teacher or someone who believed in them. You know, it's, it's, you can't imagine as a parent of an ADHD child how much impact you have. You know, we had our really dark moments where, you know, there was like Tupperware flying in the morning and really unpleasant things were being said. Um, and then we had our moments of grace where, you know, Jack, who was probably in Wh his, When were those? Yeah. <laughs> those were with me. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, when, when my son was, you know, in sixth grade, which is rock bottom, and, and he was just in such a dark place, and I said, you know, having put all these dots together and having met Hallowell, who talked about the race car brain and the bicycle brakes, which so beautifully encapsulated it. But I said, Jack, you know, you're going to be great you're gonna be fine, like you're gonna, you have all these great things, you're a sweet person, you're funny, um, you know, you're struggling now and life looks really dark, but it's gonna get better. And it has gotten better, you know, I mean, I could, have, I could have almost had him in the film if I, you know, could, could have shown his whole path and now he's doing really well and he's focused on work and he's in college and it all worked out, but for a long time we did not know how it was all gonna shake out because when you're in the moment, it, it's really scary. And so I wanted to make a film where people could see like the beginning and the end and know that um, your kids are gonna be fine. You just have to love them and find Herculean patience and uh, you know hug them all the time even when you know it's hard to hug them because they're not cooperating. So that was kind of what I wanted the film to be. Thank you. Right here. Oh, hi. Um, Nancy, I enjoyed your film very much. Um, Thank you. I, I would like to uh, proceed uh, uh, talking about the downside. Uh, certainly, we saw the still photos of these successful gentlemen on stage who had supportive families. You speak about your support of your kids. And every, every um, um, vignette in there showed very supportive parents. At the same time, you mentioned the large number of incarcerated individuals who suffer from ADHD, and uh, I certainly think that they probably did not have um, all those, all those um, people and ex uh, college experiences behind them. Uh, you also pointed out the larger number of males over females that suffer from ADHD, and this also correlates with the number of incarcerated individuals today. Um, I, would you think about doing a follow-up film addressing the downside? Um, I mean, that's possible. I think we did try to show the downside. You know, we, we followed five, five kids, or four kids and, and one adult, and, um, you know, Hogan, 
went to juvenile detention for something yeah, he yes, really didn't even he do. He seemed to come out the he seemed to be coming through in a very positive way, even despite all of those um, negative. Yeah. I mean, it's true. There's 25% of the prison population that they have diagnosed with ADHD, and those are just the people they diagnose. So, you know, ADHD, undiagnosed, untreated, um, with no support, those kids aren't going to do well. That's absolutely true. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, you're very enthusiastic. I have a question back here. Yes. Uh, um, so I, I have ADHD, and I have a question for the, the entrepreneurs. So I, I've worked in I work in the startup space, software engineer, and um, kind of get told by a lot of people in that that they think that kind of the way I think lends itself to being an entrepreneur, that kind of thing. But uh, I found for one reason or another that like before I get to that point where I really feel like I'm in a position where I can be an executive and make those kind of decisions, which I really think from what you guys are talking about and what I've heard in general is what. ADHD lends it to connecting the dots, seeing people having linear people that work for you that can do that you can do those things. But before I can get before I can get to a position where I have people working to me, I have to do kind of the smaller stuff like the the software engineering, the the making models, anything like that. And I was wondering if you guys have any advice for building the systems around you to do those kinds of things because I, I think that that's where I am at my point in my life. And if I want to get to the top or not to the top, but at a position where I can do that, I have to be able to. Uh, develop those systems? I mean, I would just say, have been in the tech field. Um, one is I would choose a place to go work where ADHD is probably like the best skill set. So choose a company where that's like, when I went to Google, for instance, I felt like I, first day I was at Google, I was like, oh my God, these are all my people. You know, because everybody there had, um, AD, not everyone, but a lot of people had ADHD. So I think being in an environment where that's an accepted skill set is important. Um, the second thing I would just say is like, even if you're not the boss, is to surround yourself with the, um, you know, Kenny has a saying called attention surplus disorder. Um, and um, I think getting people in your group already, even if you're not the boss, but working, teaming with people, on that side, and then the third thing I would just say, if there's projects that you can show off your skill set with ADHD and volunteer for those projects or create them, I think that you're just like school, going through school with kind of a rote path is probably not gonna work. Um, so I would think about going on to projects that are like very, um, will show off your dot connecting skill set, super important. And, and you have to like almost push your risk taking, like Kenny was saying, to get, get into those positions. Thank you. Yeah. I was just going to. Well, it was the last question. I would just say this. Uh, there was a band. Does everybody know the band Journey? Okay. I'm going to give this guy one piece of advice. When they were in Arizona, five, six guys uh, leaving Arizona in a beat up van, and uh, the van was going to be driven by one of the guys to Los Angeles, and they were going to go try to make it as a working band. And the bassist's father came up to the band right before they were saying their little tearful goodbyes. And he looked at the band and hugged his son. And he said, don't stop believing. And I would just say for everybody, you just got to muscle through. And of course, one of the guys in the band wrote down that lyric. And then a few years later, you know, the magic happened. So I would just say for everybody with the, that, that's mentoring the kids, just always believe in them. Um, you know, the biggest thing my parents, the gift that they gave me. They had no idea that I had anything. They, they always believed in me. And uh, I know Tim, yeah. in the film, you talked about what got you through. And I'm sure, Tom, somebody believed in you. Uh, you got to believe in these kids more than you believe in the regular kids. And that, I would just say that lyric from Journey, when I heard that story about the bassist father giving them a hug, that was, uh, you know, that's, that's what I would say is really important. Uh, Nancy, maybe we could have used that song at the end. You know, have everybody <laughs> dancing in the aisles. But th thanks, everybody. I know that was the last one. And if there's anything else, come and hit Tim Armstrong on the way out. Thank you, Grandest Film Festival. It's amazing. And thank you guys for coming thank out. For you, this long. Thank, thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Ginger. Thank you all for coming thanks, out. Andy. Have a great night. Thanks, Stuart. Oh, where can they see this after? This? Um, How can they share it? We haven't sold the film yet. We are in the process of... Uh, but I will make sure everyone that's here knows um, where the film will be. We'll share it on online our Instagram. Soon. Perfect.
online soon. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you.